Hello everyone, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Frank from WeSonic Medical. You are so welcome to attend our WeSonic Global Dandelion Program. With a mission to widely popularize the point of care ultrasound utilization in medical practice, such as anesthesiology, pain management, MSK, intensive care, and emergency medicine. By in cooperation with different experts across the globe to do online webinars or in-person workshop trainings, so far, we have completed over 700 webinars nationally and internationally since 2020, attracted over 180,000 doctors attended, received over 3.2 million reviews and comments. This time, we are honored to have invited eight renowned MSK experts in the United States to participate in our program, MSK Ultrasound Webinar Series. In these two months, they will present a comprehensive webinar series about musculoskeletal, including lecture topics on orthobiological therapies and ultrasound utilization in MSK practice, carrying common body parts like shoulder, elbow, hand, wrist, hip, foot, ankle, and knee. Here, I would like to express our most gratitude to these eight res respectable experts. Thank you. So today is our uh, fifth webinar. Let me show you my screen. Moderator to lecture with the topic on ultrasound in MSK practice, HIP. Mark Caster has abundant experience in MSK and ultrasound. He studies MS MSK and cardiac Diagnostic ultrasound profession since 2008. Became ultrasound consultant since 2012 and MSK instructor since 2014. He is member of uh, several famous societies like American Registry for Diagnostic Medical Sonography Society and the Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonography. Moreover, he is the regular moderator for all the seven webinars in this MSK ultrasound webinar series. So Mark, could you please introduce today's speaker, Dr. Joe Salas. Good morning, good evening, everyone. Appreciate all of you taking your time to listen to Dr. Sellers speak about the hip. So let me introduce you to Dr. Sellers. Uh, he's board certified in sports and family medicine. He was a team physician for the NBA team, Phoenix Suns, the NHL team, Arizona Coyotes, also Arena Football League for the Arizona Rattlers. He also was a uh, team physician for the Seattle Mariners and San Diego Padres. He was also the physician for the USA Figure Skating Championships and the USA Wrestling Team. He currently practices at Seller Sports Medicine and Family Practice in Arizona. With his academic background, he got his doctorate in osteopathy from Oklahoma State University did his internship at Phoenix General Hospital, his fellowship at the Center for Sports Medicine and Orthopedics. Dr. Sellers has vast experience in research, cl clinical research, and lectured in the use of ultrasound in point of care, sports medicine with ultrasound, and various lecturing topics, including wrestling injuries, weight loss, catastrophic sports, um, sports injuries, head and neck injuries, sudden death, steroids, adolescent medicine, rehabilitation, and regenerative medicine. Well, let me give it up to Dr. Sellers as he will talk about the hip with ultrasound. Dr. Sellers. Great, thank you. Go ahead and share screen here. All right, thank you for having me today. That's a great introduction. There's some really stellar people, very, uh, very stellar professionals that are part of this uh, program, and I'm happy and honored to be part of that. So we are uh, going to be discussing the hip out of the way here. So we're, we're going to be discussing hip today. Definitely ultrasound has been very special to me. It's, it's basically changed my game in terms of sports medicine. I've been involved with medicine uh, for this is my 35th year and I was the second sports medicine fellow in Arizona. That's how young sports medicine was. And uh, I became certified in MSK ultrasound, which was a very arduous 
journey. It's tough stuff to learn. You don't necessarily learn this in a weekend or on, on you know, like at a conference, you have to really work at it, but it can be very rewarding for you. It gives you another aspect and insurances love it. Uh, I, I love it. It's harmless, uh, painless sound wave. And again, it's been a game changer for my practice. Uh, I also do immunotherapy, orthobiologics, and uh, it, it has cut back the use of uh, surgery, unnecessary procedures, unnecessary uh, MRI scans of, and us. And, and like I say, this is something that uh, we'll get involved with here and you get a perspective on where I'm coming. So I like to use this screen because this is, uh, I, I, I watch Chris Taylor. He's the, he's the man on top there. He's an American. He's being thrown in a soup play. And if you look at the hands are locked up here on top. But on first glance, you look, Chris weights. Chris Taylor at that time weighed about 400 pounds. But it's really the West German underneath that's throwing him and pinned him and won the silver medal in that match. So especially in medicine, things are not always as they appear. Uh, I come from a, a very much a sports-minded background. My father, a hero, he was a wrestling coach, uh, successfully wrestled in the service. Uh, he was also inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. So I definitely have a special place in my heart for, for wrestling. We all tend to, to navigate in the direction of things that we really enjoy. And I, I especially enjoy sports, taking care of athletes. But I also take care of a lot of athletes that are older than I am, that are in better shape than I am. So uh, how do we take care of these athletes, though? We're, we're seeing trends in sports medicine, the, the change of sports medicine. And we used to have x-ray, we had MRI. Joe Sellers, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, I find the audience cannot so see your screen. Can you reshell okay. your screen? Okay, good there. Okay. Are we ready to go then? That's good. Beautiful, yes. okay, thank you. So. Uh, but again, we, we have a, a new perspective because we have different trends. And the biggest trend I see right now is MSK ultrasound. And why would you want to do MSK ultrasound? It's accurate. It's precise. If you are, have excellent precision, your efficacy will increase. Your outcomes will increase. And also, it's very cost effective for insurances. It's about a fifth or sixth the cost of an MRI scan or other type of higher level imaging. So right now, accuracy uh, with, with all different areas, if you look at this, if this graph here is ultrasound versus palpation, which I also call the blind technique, and there's fluoroscopy. And if we look down here with hip, which we'll be adjusting today, uh, hip joint, 97% uh, accuracy versus even 51% with fluoro. <clears throat> So uh, I think a lot of people are moving toward ultrasound for hip injections for that main reason. And piriformis outperforms the fluoroscopy as well. So invention of the stethoscope. Rene Lenec back in 1816, obviously the stethoscope uh, was uh, another game changer. your hip sartorius, hip joint, acetabulum, the fibrocartilage, the labrum, and then we have iliopsoas and rectus femoris. So when we're using ultrasound, and again, I have uh, perhaps a wide range of listeners today from the beginner to the very advanced, but we're going to try to provide a broad sweep for everybody with this, with this commentary today. The sartorius attaches anterior superior iliac spine, and it certainly courses across the, the leg diagonally, and it ends up attaching at the pes. So we're looking at the screen on the left shows us our ultrasound picture. The screen on the right with the uh, model shows the sartorius in long position here. 
And we can see from the orange uh, diagram there what depicts the sartorius. We have, get this down here. We have the sartorius in the short axis. And as we look at that there, this is as the, the beam is coming right at us versus lengthwise. So again, the old adage in radiology, two, uh, one view is no view. We need at least more than one view. It gives you a better perspective anyway. So we look at the, the femoral head. We're looking at the femoral head. We're looking at the shaft. You can see the, 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 the joint space in here as well. And on, in front of that, we have the iliopsoas, the large iliopsoas muscle, very important muscle. We have uh, the, the rectus uh, component. We have the labrum, the acetabulum right here. And we have it both in, in short, we can have it in long axis as well. So uh, this is the femoral head right here, nice and round on this patient. We also have the joint space. We have a reflection down here. That joint space continues on along the shaft uh, longer than you might expect. So that plays into your injection techniques. Uh, we have a short axis of the femoral head right here. Here's our femoral head down here. Here's our psoas muscle uh, that's, that's above it there. So again, getting a perspective of long axis versus short axis. Uh, femoral head, short axis right here. Again, psoas in front. And then we look at the acetabulum, which is in the, the uh, left of the screen right here. There's your labrum uh, of the hip. We have labrum in both hip and in shoulder, and probably the, the uh, it's analogous to the meniscus in the knee. But we also have the iliopsoas bursa. We have the uh, the uh, psoas bursa and rectus up in here. We're, we're looking at these structures. Here's where our, our acetabulum fits right in there, and that's where our labrum sits in there. Here's a view of the psoas in a long view. You can see the, the length of that. Uh, long axis, you can see the lines that delineate there. We have the psoas major, the iliacus that definitely form and they converge and attach to the lesser trochanter. So here we are in the short axis, same thing, but we've got this major muscle. It's a huge muscle. Many times it's overdeveloped in many athletes. It's uh, their posterior hip, posterior thigh are underdeveloped compared to their anterior thigh and hip. And we see that also in, in, in the knee when we have uh, overdeveloped hamstrings relative to quadriceps. So your ratios, uh, that type thing. So uh, it is a very common muscle associated with back pain, hip pain, and something that uh, uh, we're seeing more with ultrasound. It's opened my eyes, definitely. I have pretty good palpatory skills, pretty good clinical skills, but man, this really makes me look good. So ultrasound is a fantastic tool for finding these things. So let's keep going here. This is an iliopsoas bursal injection, long axis. Here's our, our femoral head down here. You can see the needle placement right now. And think about the iliopsoas. It's the buffer. It's a, it's a spongy sac. Any bursa is a fluid-filled sac that helps the gliding motion or protects the, the gliding or the the shearing motion of tendons in your body. And I always tell my medical students that if you do not have a tendon sheath, you have a bursa. So in the hip, there is no tendon sheath to the psoas, so therefore there is a bursa. And so bursitis can be very painful in, in the hip, anterior hip, cause a lot of pain, impingement. So we're gonna take a needle. I always like to inject right to left. And now we know our anatomy, we find our pathology. I'm using a 22 gauge needle. I use a spinal needle. Um, I don't use all of the three and a half inches of the needle, but I also tell them that uh, don't look at the needle because it, it's gonna get me where I wanna go. And the last thing I want to do is miss it because the needle is not at the right depth. But I always like to uh, inject from right to left. You can see the, the trapezoid view right here too. I prefer curvilinear, uh, injections to the hip, to the anterior hip, to the lateral hip, and even to the posterior shoulder. You'll sometimes need that in obese patients with knee problems that you just can't get down to the structures. And those of you that uh, have both linear and curvilinear, you know, the linear has a higher frequency 
usually probably from eight to 18 megahertz versus say a, a curvilinear, which may be four to eight megahertz. And what that does, you just have higher frequency wave, but it fizzles out after three centimeters or so. Whereas the longer, slower wave of a curvilinear gets you down to these deeper structures. So curvilinear, I'm an in plane because you can see the needle here. It's it's a it's it's a kind of a rotated view of this. This is a this is a lateral position. I don't have a picture of the position I'm doing, but I'm going to have you keep an eye right in here. Here's our here's our bursal space in here, going in, going in, and then we're injecting right in this space here. So there's our needle. You can see the medication flow. We don't want to get down to the joint. We want to be above that a little bit too. So uh, I use this one. This is an articular injection. I'm gonna move one screen ahead. Now, if you look at this, uh, most people might think that looks like a Rorschach ink blot right there. Uh, that, you know, it's guess what I'm, what I'm looking at. That is a hip. Now let's go down here. Here's our hip. Here's the nice round femoral head. Here's our iliopsoas. Now let's go back up. And this is what's left of this gentleman's hip. This guy is a cool guy. He's about my age. We are kindred spirits because we're getting older and uh, occasionally uh, the wheels fall off the bus. So in his case, we've been trying to stave off surgery. We've tried injections. We've tried PRP. He also has some back issues. He, now he's getting contractures. And I said, brother, it's, it's time for you to have a total joint replacement. But I use this because, again, you get to the point where we have utilized everything non-surgical. And so the patient feels comfortable. I feel comfortable that, that we've, we fought the good fight. But I'm curvilinear. You can see the needle right to left coming down here. And we're going to hit this spot where the, where the joint is. So you're going to see the needle coming in. And you can see that filling that space. So we know we hit a bullseye. We know that's in the joint. And that's PRP right there, platelet plasma. So we, we know we have liftoff there. It's not, well, we think we got it. It's no, we saw it fill it. We, we were able to videotape. So that's also the beauty of ultrasound is that you can take static views, you can scan, and you can also uh, uh, look at vascular structures and things. Unlike an MRI where it's not a therapeutic tool, it's purely diagnostic and you can't move in an MRI. So uh, again, Here's our femoral head. You saw the other, and you can see from this end right here, the position that we're using for that, for that long axis. Here is the a long axis here to the left and the short axis to the right. You just got to get comfortable, get that ultrasound transducer on that patient and, 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 and take a look and keep working at it. And eventually it's like a foreign language. Uh, starting off in foreign language, you know words, then you know sentences, and then you can start putting together paragraphs and understanding. It does take, it just, it's stepwise. It takes a while. Uh, this is a, a rectus femoris here in the orange, and it's both long axis, short axis. We have uh, the uh, rectus femoris here in the long axis that comes in here. And uh, so that attaches to the anterior inferior iliac spine. Of course, it, it's the only thigh, thigh muscle, the only quadricep muscle that crosses both the hip and the knee. It's a hip flexor, it's a knee extender. And uh, so we can see soft tissue injuries with all these muscles and tendons. Uh, and it, it, it's amazing that we can, we can utilize this without causing any pain necessarily or very minimal pain, probably just with, with what we call sono palpation, just with the palpation of the transducer. But it's very well tolerated. The patient can look at the, the films with us. We go through every film with them. We explain the anatomy, what we're trying to prove. And I think the patient is, is very much an active participant in their care, which I think they appreciate that. And they know I'm not a surgeon. So my goal in life is to keep them away from a surgeon as long as possible. So we're getting out into lateral structures here. We have greater trochanter, we have the glute medius minimus, and then we have the trochanteric bursa. And regarding the lateral hip, uh, the greater trochanter pain syndrome for years, for decades, possibly longer than that century or so, uh, the common, the common uh, description was it is a trochanteric bursitis. Oh, you've got a bursitis. 
Well, we, we don't see very, uh, very often, we don't see the bursitis. We see the tendinopathy. We see the soft tissue changes, but the burst is not inflamed. And it's kind of fun when you get one that is inflamed because it's, it's it, again, it's not a common thing. But it is something that is more commonly, in my opinion, with the gluteus medius. I see some with glute me, uh, minimus. And don't forget, I think one, uh, one tendon that's overlooked is the iliotibial band. That, that, that's very intimate with, with the gluteal muscles. It sits right on top, superficial to it. So there are a couple of distinct bands to the glute medius. You think about the glute medius, it attaches to the, uh, the lateral facet of the trochanter. Uh, anterior most common, posterior can happen, but uh, you, know, you see the, the, the glute minimus attached to the anterior facet of the tro uh, trochanter. The glute medius attaches to the lateral facet, and the glute max does not attach to the trochanter. So uh, that's your primary hip flexor. You remember from, uh, you know, perhaps your anatomy that the gluteus medius externally rotates the hip, the glute minimus adducts and internally rotates the hip, and then you have the glute max, which is primarily an extender of the, of the hip. So when we're looking at this structure here, we're looking at it in a short axis on the right here, and you're going to look for what, what we a lot, of, a lot of times call the stick house. There's the roof. There's, the, there's the, the, the top, the apex of the roof. And so we can determine that's our trochanter here. I like to maintain the, the cursor toward the midline or toward the head. That's just how I was trained. Uh, people do it differently, but I like to be uniform. And I don't care whether it's a right extremity or a left extremity. I always try to have the cursor toward the proximal, toward the head. And then when I inject, I'm always trying to inject from the right to left. Again, that's just my, my comfort zone. And whether, again, it's, it doesn't matter which extremity, I, I see the needle coming in from right to left. So greater trochanter, short view. This is how I inject right here as well. We'll see that in a minute. But I have a, uh, uh, this is linear. I prefer curvilinear. That's, again, purely your, your own, uh, uh, you know, your own, your own uh, preference. I, I get bigger patients in the office, and I really do need to use the, the curvilinear on them. Uh, thinner patients, muscular patients, don't have a lot of body fat, not a problem with the linear. But here's our stick house right here. And then as we get in here, we're, we're looking at the greater trochanter long view now. We're looking at the long view of that. You can see the, the transducer placement right there. Here is the uh, greater trochanter down here in this area long axis. Here's the bursa long axis. And we're going to get this picture right here. There's our bursa that sits between the two gluteal, uh, gluteal folds right there, greater trochanter bursa. And then we have the, the uh, there's, our, there's, there's our, our greater trochanter bursa in a short axis. Do you see the the short axis here versus the long axis of the transducer. So let's get into the lateral hip. Let me get over here. And this is, this is what's beautiful about the ultrasound. You can take the ultrasound. I like a position of, of comfort with my hand. I like to keep my hypothenar on the patient's body. I like to hold it kind of like a pencil. Everybody's technique's a little different. One thing you can't do is hold it up here for very long. You'll, 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 you'll uh, fatigue very quickly and you will, uh, you will have disdain for the ultrasound <laughs> transducer if you do that too long. So it's a comfort. It's ergonomically uh, pretty comfortable there. And most people have a tendency to push down too hard when they're trying to examine somebody. And frankly, sometimes you push so hard, you distort the anatomy. So here's our transducer. Looks like we're in short axis. And we're going to watch this because he's just... He's just scanning here. Now you can see, I'm not, I'm going to keep my cursor away. You can see the, the uh, positioning there. He's moving more toward the anterior part. So there we're looking at glute min. And then if you wanted to come back more posteriorly, we, we would find glute medius. But you kind of got to know structure. You got to know anatomy. What are you looking at? And especially in soft tissue that can be fairly deep with this, always trying to find your landmarks, your bony landmarks. Uh, that always helps me 
it sharpens up the soft tissue, but I like to, I like to, uh, you know, find my, my, my bony landmarks. Therefore I can determine, okay, that's the greater trochanter, anterior facet, glute men, uh, lateral facet, glute, glute meat. The iliotibia band, don't forget that iliotibia band because it sits, it sits on top of the glutes. And of course that extends from the, the uh, trochanter area all the way down to the uh, Gertie's tubercle in the knee there. So it's long, it's thin, there's not a lot of muscle, but boy, it causes a lot of, lot of trouble with people that do running sports, pivoting sports, plyometrics, box jumps, things of that nature. Uh, this is shown here in the short axis. We have the glute minimus in short axis here, and then we get it right here. There's our short axis right there. And then we have the glute minimus in the long axis. So again, it adducts and internally rotates the hip, whereas the glute medius externally rotates the hip. So here's our glute medius, short axis. You can see the transducers placed crosswise across that. But if we rotate that, here's our glute medius, you know, of course, on our illustrations. Here's our, our, our transducer rotated 90 degrees. So here's our short axis. We rotate it 90 degrees and there's your glute medius long axis. So here's our glute medius. So here's one of these injections that I, that I, I, I do on uh, one of my patients. You can see how gnarly this bone looks. It's got a lot of cortical irregularity right there. You can see the needle coming in. Now this is an 18 gauge. I've numbed this. I've anesthetized this. Usually I use bupivacaine for tendon or, 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 or uh, or bursas, and I'll use lidocaine for the joints. I avoid bupivacaine in joints. But here's our needle coming in right to left. Here's our trapezoid, which is a curvilinear process here. This person is an older patient. Uh, again, we're trying to keep, keep this patient away from surgery. There is no surgery on the lateral trochanter, but we see so many people that have lateral hip pain that, that mimic sciatica. They go to their doc, they order an MRI of their lumbar spine. It's not their back, it's their hip. Where's their pain source? I'll say, let's inject your hip and see what it does to your back. And many times it relaxes and relieves some of their back pain. And so therefore it's a much cheaper, much easier way. Plus patients, I know it's not painful, but an MRI is, is a lot of stress for a lot of people. And it's expensive and it requires a lot of hoops that you have to jump through to get to it. So this is something that's clean, it's easy. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that, but it's very, very, you know, we have <laughs> done a ton of them, so I'm pretty good at it. But it is something that is much more amenable than uh, a, a bunch of workup. And, and you know, because I, again, I can see these patients, and I think I, I can find their pain source fairly quickly. Needle coming in right to left, we're gonna inject, this is glute men over here, glute, glute uh, meat over here. We're in the short axis, so we're gonna inject that thing. now. I'm not showing part of this, but I come in with that uh, needle. I like to use an 18 gauge because I like to do like a mini tenotomy. I go in there and puncture that. A lot of times these things are not new. They come in and I say, well, I've had lateral hip. How long have you had it? I've had it two years. That's not acute. Bursitis probably is done. It's scar tissue, it's tendinopic, it's tendinosis, it's not itis. We're getting away from the itis term for that region. reason. So here we are, lateral trochanteric injection. We're using that as our landmark. We come in here now, we're gonna put medication. You can see that filter right in there. And again, I, I don't believe in, in lateral hip surgery. I think that it's fraught with problems. You're cutting into the glute mid, glute med, the uh, IT band, there's gamellus, there's piriformis, there's all sorts of landmines in that. And that's where I think you're seeing now with total joint re replacements, arthroplasties in the hip, they're using more of an anterior approach. They're staying away from that area. It's such a fulcrum of the pelvis, the low back, and the, the upper leg. So here is our, our thing. We're going to go to uh, diagnostic ultrasound posterior. We're gonna go into the posterior area, the ischial tuberosity is a great structure. That's where all your hammies attach, semimembranosis, and then you have the conjoint tendon, which is the semitendinosis and the biceps femoris. So that being said, I love the hamstrings. Uh, I think they're very cool anatomically because they, they attach 
laterally and some rotate medially, and they also have a little braid. They kind of cross over each other. And we all know how strong braided rope is. So uh, that's, that's, that's a, perhaps a God thing right there. It's, it's cool how our bodies, the structure affects our function. And they're very strong muscles, but they're very uh, frustrating for your athletes or your, your, even your recreational athletes because they take you know, a long time to heal. Sometimes they feel great, then they tweak it, and now the clock starts over again. So we're going to get into this a little bit. Here's our ischial tuberosity short axis. So here's our, our short axis across here and our ischial tuberosity right along in here. You can see the bone right there. Sharpen that bone up. Find that bone. And here's our, here's our tendon right there. There's our, there's our ischial tuberosity. Here's a long view of that. So you're gonna see more like a teardrop shape right here. And then you, you, you see the tendon and it's attached right here along the ischial tuberosity. There's our, here's our ischial tuberosity. Here's our, here's our uh, semimembranosus. And again, the semimembranosus long axis, you're gonna see it lengthwise here. Here is a uh, short axis. You can see it right. So it's again, it's coming at you, or it's 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 you're seeing it uh, lengthwise in there. You get into the conjoint tendon. Here's our conjoint tendon. Uh, we're looking at it from a long axis. And again, I want the cursor to be pointed toward the patient's head or cephalad. And there's this is uh, this is the the posterior view. This is toward the buttocks. This is toward the knee. And here's our tendon from a, a long axis view. And you're kind of seeing them moving that just ever so slightly. Look at the, the subtle play with that ultrasound. And you're not moving a lot. If you move it too much, it really distorts your view. You gotta be really calm and cool about that. So here's our semimembranosus long axis. We have the conjoint tendon, short axis here. You can see these structures, they, they attach right there at the ischial tuberosity. Here is a conjoint tendon in the long axis. Here's the attachment, here's the bone. Here's the attachment right here. We get into the muscle down here, the, the muscle uh, tendon uh, junction there. So there's our, there's our posterior hip with the semitendinosus biceps, which is the conjoint tendon. This is one of my patients. He's a 60 plus year old gentleman. He's had bilateral knee arthroplasties, total joints. He is in martial arts. He was doing a flying kick and a ruptured part of his, his hamstring. He evolves a piece of bone off the ischial tuberosity. He struggled with this for about six months. And he was seen by an orthopedic surgeon and said, you know what, this is not surgical, go see Sellers. And so he has a, uh, has a proximal hamstring injury. We're doing a a PRP. So we're going to be, we're going to be anesthetizing this area. I use a 22 gauge. This is cephalad. You can see it's a, it, this one is a curvilinear. We got a, a trapezoidal view here. We're coming in right to left down onto that bone there uh, on down to the ischium. So you see the needle coming in. Now I'm going to use a 22 gauge to anesthetize and I'll switch over to an 18. So I kind of find my track here. I'm, I'm pushing through the glute muscles, getting down and I'm getting on top of getting on top of that right there. So there's our, there's our needle. And if, if, uh, if you get lost, I mean, sometimes, you know, you, you can jiggle. Sometimes you get lost in there. Stop, find your needle. If you don't find your needle, you don't want to inject anything. You want to make sure you know what the tip of that thing is, but here's our next needle. We're, we're, uh, well, I think that's the same one there. So we're going to do here. So I changed out to an 18 gauge. So what I'm doing here, I'm doing tenotomy. So we're going to beat up that tendon. Uh, the theory is that there's scar tissue in there. There's tendinopic changes, tendinopathy or tendinosis. It's no longer itis. This guy's had this for six months. This is not a fresh injury. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish uh, a new beachfront here, a new, new blood supply, new inflammatory component. So I'm using an 18 gauge. I'm coming down here. I'm going to beat on this ischial tuberosity. I've obviously anesthetized that. But I use an 18 gauge, it's nice and thick. It's not, I don't worry about bending or, or doing something worse with that needle, but we're softening that. I, I kind of describe it like frozen snow. You have a, 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 a kind of a crunchy layer on top 
and below there's softer layer. And what'll happen with your needle, you can see what you're doing at all times. I'm seeing what I'm doing, I'm at a perfect spot. And I also am able to tactically feel that with my fingers. And I can feel that resistance and then it punches through, resistance punches through, and eventually it's, it's all fairly soft in there. And I know that I'm done, all right? So here's our tenotomy. Then after the tenotomy, I come in with the PRP, I switch out the syringe, we phlebotomize the patient, we've done all that and I switch that out and then I put the PRP in there. You can see that infiltrate. So very pleased with that. The guy's got to shut down. Uh, in, in rehab, and we can't get into that, but rehab, there's a mantra I tell the patients, less is more. You got to really shut down, you can't do a lot because you'll ruin your, your investment in there. So that being said, we're talking about orthobiologics. Uh, I use human chorion membrane injections. Uh, that's that uh, you know that's human chorion. I I have several products that I've used. I'm in a study too where we do research at our facility. So I'm doing a 3B study on one of the human chorion membranes. I did one last year too uh, with a colleague of mine, um, and we had great success with this. It's kind of on a hiatus. FDA is is, is asked voluntarily to stop using it. And there's a lot of uh, weird stuff that has, uh, you know, in, in the orthobiologics arena uh, that should not be used. So there's only two products that are used, human carnial membrane products that have a, an investigational new drug. And those are the only ones that we use. Anything else should not be used. But I, I, my mainstay is platelet-rich plasma. We phlebotomize the patient. We obviously, we, we, we get the plasma. We spin it twice and we get a, a very high platelet con, con, concentration that we use. And there's also bone marrow aspirate concentrate. Uh, I, don't, I don't do BMAC. I, I have colleagues that do BMAC for some of those. I know one of my colleagues has described uh, bone marrow aspirate concentrate as platelet-rich plasma on steroids. And I also uh, have used the microfragmented fat harvesting or transfer that's where we take fat from your body. We, we, we uh, liquefaction that fat, we break it down, we flush it out. It's full of growth factors, it's full of cells. Uh, there's some controversy as well. There's more cell types in the, the fat, microfragmented fat than there are uh, the bone marrow aspirate concentrate, but is it really quantity or is it quality? So that's, that's for the researchers in there. And, and we're part of some of that research, which is a lot of fun. Percutaneous tenotomy, we just showed that. Sometimes I'll soften that, that area up, that lesion up first, and then we can go back and we can, we can hammer it with the uh, biologicals. But there's, there's normal wound healing, there's inflammatory process that can take maybe the first several days to 10 days, then you get migration of cells to that area, proliferative properties, all these cell types try to go in there and try to try to whether it be an infection or an injury, they try to repair. They are, there are, are killer cells in there. There are anti-inflammatory cells. There's all sorts of cells in there. And then you get the remodeling, which usually takes months, weeks to months. So what happens is you get a prolonged inflammatory phase when it's not healing properly. And you can think of a fracture. You can think of a, a delayed uh, healing of a hamstring or an Achilles tendon and it gets stalled out in the inflammatory phase. And then what happens eventually, you, you think about ideally when your, your tissues get torn, they pull apart, and then eventually you want them to realign themselves. And this is how we want it to heal. If that all is done, that's normal, that's great. They heal, they go back and they, they're back to their sport. But what happens if it heals like this? Then the inflammation part quiets down and it's no longer inflammation, it's, it's scar tissue. And we used to just put steroid in scar tissue and you go, wow, well, that helped for about two weeks. It's Band-Aid therapy. We backed off quite a lot on steroids. Here's, here is PRP, platelet-rich plasma. We phlebotomize the patient. In this case, we, use, we make our own. Uh, we phlebotomize 60 cc's. We take the whole blood and we separate it out. We spin it through one cycle. So here's our, here's our, our plasma. Here's our red blood cells. We discard the red blood cells. We put them in the other container to balance out the centrifuge. And we spin this again. And we end up with a pellet 
down here. There's your platelet-rich plasma. And we use leukocyte-poor platelet-rich plasma for joints, leukocyte-poor. We use leukocyte-rich platelet-rich plasma for tendon sheaths, ligaments, uh, and most everything else. So uh, here's our finished product. It's getting ready. There's the golden fleece. We're taking that over there and we inject into whatever extremity uh, that you're, you're, you're going to do. Now, here's micro-fragmented adipose harvesting. Um, the FDA says you cannot uh, manipulate tissue. You can't, you know, uh, aspirate tissue and put some type of uh, chemical product and inject it back into somebody. But what this does, this is micro-fragmented. Basically, we're, we're breaking up the fat from larger molecules, I guess, or particles to smaller particles. Now, the beautiful thing about micro-fragmented adipose harvesting is there is a plethora of, of fat in the United States. We have, we have quite the resource to draw from, uh, myself included, if I ever had to have this done. But we do it through the belly. We anesthetize the skin. We use a trocar. In essence, it's, it's liposuction to the abdomen. And uh, patients taught it very well. We, we aspirate, we, we emulsify, or really, I shouldn't say emulsify, but we, it's liquefaction. We put heparin, saline, we flush it through there, and we suction off this product. This is the crude, crude oil right there. That is the adipose tissue. There's oils mixed in it. This is full of, full of factors, and it's full of cells. It's full of some stem cells. It's full of hematopoietic cells, uh, mesenchymal cells, and hematopoietic cells. That's a big controversy right now as to what really works. And in this case, we steer clear of the term stem cell because that may not be an appropriate term. Um, I use orthobiologics. I've gotten away from the word regenerative as well. We're not really, we can't tell someone we're going to regenerate your meniscus. We're going to grow back a new meniscus. It's going to be beautiful. We can't say that. Well, we can say that we are trying to promote tissue healing. That's very fair. And it's very safe because these are products basically that are your own body. They're autologous. Now, the human chorion membrane is separate. Uh, it's taken from healthy mom, healthy babies. Um, I am Catholic. I, I, I'm not doing anything with embryonic tissue or fetal tissue. This is healthy mom, healthy baby. They donate their placentas. And so, and they can't be paid for that. That's illegal in the United States. So uh, I think that you're going to be seeing a change where we're using the adipose harvest for uh, those with arthritis. I think it's going to replace other products that are on the market that are FDA approved because I think these work better and they work longer. So what are we gonna do with this? We're gonna put this and we're gonna set up saline. We're gonna flush this back and forth and we're gonna to try to, to get rid of all the, the oils and waste products which will drain downhill into a bag. And if you can see this thin line here, that's your adipose tissue. The rest of this is saline. So here are these balls, they're ball bearings. And basically we shake that like we would if we're making a martini. And what happens with that is it, it micro fragments, it breaks up that fat. And then we suction out and, and filter it. So we have the fat, this is the, this is the golden fleece up here at the top. So watch this, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Boom, right there. There's our golden fleece. That's what we're gonna use to inject into a knee, shoulder, hip type thing. So um, right now, Let's move over here. I'm, I'm going to wrap it up here in just a minute. Uh, my key points, well, be systematic. I always talk about sequencing, learning things uh, by the numbers, working hard at it, studying, and, and, and be systematic. When you're examining a shoulder, a hip, when you're doing ultrasound, do it the same way every time. Sequence it the same way every time. And you'll start to recognize normal, 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 and then, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't look right. And the beauty is we, most of us have two extremities. Look at the other side if you need to and see what, maybe that is their normal. Maybe it's, it, it has a different uh, texture tissue quality. But the, the MSK ultrasound is revolutionizing my practice. I've been, I've been involved with it uh, since 2014. I've got a great group of people that I really enjoy. We meet twice a year. 
uh, at, a, at, a, at a, a, a national conference meeting in Vegas. We share ideas. There's not a ton of, uh, and Mark is nodding too. It's, there's, there's not a ton of egos. Um, it's great. And what are people around the United States doing? I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I'm doing what these guys are doing because it's, it, they, they've done the research. Uh, and obviously, you know your anatomy. Um, and I'm an osteopathic physician. Our founder, Andrew Tater, still always talked about structure and function. What is the structure of that and how does it function? And knowing, obviously, normal from abnormal, knowing the pathology, if you can locate the pain source, and sometimes I'll do a little experiment, and I'll tell my patients, don't you love your doctor experimenting on you? But I may block that, and if I eliminate their pain, I say, okay, now our chances are much higher that we're going to hit the right spot for you. And they're more willing to proceed with, say, some of the biological products, because we have confidence that we know where to knock out their pain source. And also understanding the body's inherent capabilities of self-healing. I mean, the inflammation is uniform. Sometimes it gets out of whack. Obviously, other standards or other factors can affect it, whether it be autoimmune disease or diabetes. And Mark, you'll attest to this as well. Tissue textures are different in people that are healthy versus those that are smokers, that have a peripheral vascular disease that have diabetes. The tissue quality is different. It's, it's, there's disease. That's why it is a metabolic and anatom anatomic disease, you know, a, a, as well. So, but we, we all need each other. There's great, uh, there's great ultrasonographers out there. There's physicians, there's therapists, there's chiropractors, there are athletic trainers. And uh, I really enjoy working with this. I get psyched up about it. And I really appreciate you allowing me the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you tonight. Dr. Sellers, appreciate your time this evening. Great, great lecture on the hip. I've learned a few things myself during this lecture, which is always great. Like you said, the Vegas course where we kind of brainstorm with each other and just learn about stuff. Um, like I said, I've learned a few things and pathology wise scanning methods. So great lecture. Uh, we have a few questions if you have time sure. to go through some of these. All right. Okay, let's see here. One question here. Can you visualize the SI joint? Um, yes, I, I, I inject SI joints. Um, I, I use a curvilinear. And what I'll do is I'll start right about L5S1. And I'll, it's, it's, I'm not sure how to describe it other than you can see the spinous process of S1. And it looks to me almost like a butterfly. And I'll start to move laterally toward the SI joint. And you can palpate, you can literally mark if you want to use a marker and mark the posterior superior iliac spine, the PSIS. And that knob on an ultrasound will start to appear and it'll start to rise up. It has a white cap on it because it's, 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 hypo, it's hyperechoic, it's bone. And you'll be able to palpate the the uh, PSIS, and then just medial to that, you'll see a slip off like a little ski slope, and you'll see the, the, the sacrum come over, and there's your invagination, there's your joint right there. And so what I like to do is I take curvilinear, I usually utilize a 22 gauge, and I'll start at the midline, and I'll come over, I'll come across that, that SI joint at about a 45 degree angle, I had a great one last week. I even felt the pop of the capsule when I put that needle through there. And she did great. Um, on, her, on her stomach prone, I, I pooch up their pelvis with a pillow. So I put a little buttress to, to make their kind of put a little hump in, the, in their buttocks area. And it, and it gives you a little better angle of that. But those are, uh, those are great injections because again, there's, there's another joint. Again, being an osteopathic physician, see a ton of SI joint that relates to the spine. It's, 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 it is one of the fulcrums of the spine, the pelvis and the sacrum. So yes, very amenable to injection. Excellent point. Next question here. Do you feel ultrasound is gaining ground versus MRI in hip imaging? And along that uh, question here, I'm gonna add a little bit to this question here because I know you kind of brought it up in the beginning is 
the acetabulum and the joint space? Can you really see a lot of fluid? Can you see damage to the labrum and so forth? Well, you can see just like the meniscus, you, you primarily see the, the peripheral uh, one third of the meniscus. And certainly you can see evidence of extrusion, flattening, and then you have associated cortical changes. So the same thing can happen in the hip where you, the, the, the acetabular labrum is a little more difficult to see. I think if you're looking for deeper labral tears than the MRI with contrast, and really it's with arthrogram contrast is a superior test. Uh, the only reason I would uh, do an MRI with contrast if I think they need to see a surgeon or perhaps my diagnosis is suspect, but I can get great views of the hip. I can look at the labrum. I know that just like the labrum in the shoulder, a lot of the surgeons are backing off on trying to repair labrums in the hip because some of the long-term studies show that more conservative care. And frankly, I think that's where our work is coming in, Mark, where we are able to do selective percutaneous therapy to that area and get just about as good of a response as they would if they had surgery. So um, I, I do use the ultrasound frequently for the hip. I do hip injections. Um, I do PRP. I have had, I have done, you know, steroids in there. I've just backed off so much on steroids now. But if, I, if I'm concerned if I have a young kid, I mean, I mean, kid, like maybe they're a teenager or they're college level athlete, I'm going to be a little more aggressive with workup on that. And myself included in that group, um, you know, be careful what you look for on me. You're going to find something. I mean, I wrestled in college. I have plenty of wear and tear. Uh, and, and, and so for me, I have degenerative meniscus. Um, I see a lot of people over 50 crowd that have degenerative labrums and we're not going to be super aggressive with those at all. You know, we're going to take care of that. But the, the, the point, if they're saying, okay, if this is a surgical thing, the, the problem with the, the gain in ultrasound is it's slow. And I am fortunate to be in, in Phoenix. I live, uh, you know, within, you know, 20 miles of some excellent ultrasonographers that live here. Some that are on our panel and they're great friends of mine, and we bounce ideas off each other. We learn from each other, and uh, we've grown up together in, in the ultrasound world. That being said, we still lack some infrastructure with getting the word out. I have some physicians that know a little bit about it, some that have no idea what I'm talking about, and some that are pretty, pretty savvy. The younger crowd, I teach medical students, I teach residents. And they are getting it in med school now. They're getting it in their residency. And uh, even especially some of the sports medicine fellowships, they're getting their ultrasound training. And that's, that's where they need to be. They need to have that in their training before they come out. And we'll get better. It's just going to take probably a good generation. And you've seen it probably in the last you know, six or eight years. People understand even about platelet-rich plasma or bone marrow extract concentrate. They had no idea. And I didn't know really... 10 years ago, really what was, you know, I, I had a general understanding, but so there's my, my answer to that. The hip, yes, for uh, MRI with arthrogram contrast, if you're thinking they need to see a surgeon. And then, uh, you know, we're, we're getting, everyone is, that's, that, that I work around, we're all very excited. It just takes a while. I can't believe it's already been 2014 to 2022 that I've been involved with this. So uh, I'm not going anywhere either. I'm going to be practicing. My son will be uh, starting a sports medicine fellowship here in another month. And uh, he's, he's training in, in the same vein as I, but also he, he's going to have the advantage of having ultrasound training in, in his fellowship program. Very true. Thank you. Next question here. Um, it kind of goes back to the PRP bone marrow effort. Can you tell me about more about your two spin technique for PRP, the speed, duration, and final concentration? Well, I'd have to pull that up here. I took a picture of that. And like when we're, you know, we like, like here's, we spin the blood. We have 60 cc's of blood. Now we have 230 cc amounts. And so we'll spin um, for two minutes, you know, say uh, 2170, I guess, is the speed there on our centrifuge. Then what we do is we separate out and the next 
The next spin we, we do for five minutes and 30 seconds at 2170 as well. So um, beyond that, that's something that I learned from, you know, conference in Vegas. And uh, I use that protocol. Uh, the the uh, group that I got that from, they do research, they do bioassays on all their products. And so I don't, I don't have a bioassay machine. I was, I was told by their group, they said, you don't need one. They do it every day, multiple times a day. And they get a, a, they get a very strong concentration of eight to 10 X or eight to 10 times the concentration of normal platelet rich plasma. That's probably the, the, the cool thing now that we see is that, you know, before, Hey, let's put plasma in there. And we would just draw the plasma up and inject it in there. I remember one of my, my cohorts here who has been involved with uh, ultrasound since the early 2000s said they used to just put blood into that. They, they didn't even spin the blood and take the plasma out. They just, they did whole blood and inject it into uh, areas. And, and of course that would really irritate it. And it's not really the red blood cells that produce anything. They obviously have their job. They have a fantastic job in their body, but it's the platelet rich plasma and it's, it's the platelet, the higher the concentration, probably it, you're running on premium unleaded. It's just, a, it's a higher concentration. So that's what I think we're going to be fine tuning here in the next five years or so is what is a superior product? I think the cream will rise with that. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Great point. Plus each manufacturer has different protocols on spin, uh, therapy, the speed, duration, and so forth. But uh, right. yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. Next question here. When scanning a patient's hip, do you ever have them standing to get weight-bearing images? I don't. Um, I, I will get some, you know, on, in, in rare cases, I might get standing x-ray views of that. Or if I'm looking for like a sacral base unleveling or a, or a leg discrepancy, that type thing. But I uh, have, have not done, I've not performed standing views or, you know, scans of, of hip uh, for that. I guess I probably want to ask what more specific would you be looking for with that? You know, uh, the, the question, it was just a, a question of do, do you do standing weight bearing views with ultrasound? I don't. Okay, great. Okay. Another question, in children, do you use ultrasound to diagnose hip dysplasia? If so, do you have any tricks to get the best imaging? I, I don't really see that population. Um, I do pediatrics with, uh, with ultrasound. It's very safe. It's sound wave. It's a different waveform than what you might see in therapy. Therapy is a, is a higher waveform. It's contraindicated with kids with open growth plates, but this is a low frequency. It's very safe. Uh, we picked up fractures, occult fractures in kids, of uh, physeal fractures in kids that we can't see on x-ray. And I also have a little trick I use for that is I use a tuning fork on that and that'll really light them up and lets me know that there's probably a fracture hiding in there. But I, I, don't, uh, I don't see that population with hip dysplasia, I practice. Excellent. Last question that we have, can you describe the best method of diagnosing snapping hip with the use of ultrasound? Well, that's a tricky one. You need a you need a really good ultrasonographer that you know. That's almost a three handed technique where you 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 place the the transducer in the in the crease of the hip and you try to you try to uh, ex extend the hip and flex the hip and and rotate internally and externally rotate while you're holding on to that transducer. So uh, that is is something that it, it's tricky. That requires a lot of practice, though. And I mean, the patient, whether it be the, the, the iliopsoas or whether it's the IT band that's snapping, sometimes those are difficult. And, uh, uh, but that, that's, that's a technique that, um, you know, it requires for me, it requires more than me. And I have a great ultrasonographer. So that's a team, that's a team approach right there. Absolutely. Good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Dr. Sellers, I appreciate your time this evening. Great lecture on the hip. And now you turn it over to Frank, talk about the next lectures. Great. Hi, Dr. Salas. Uh, I home behalf of We Sonic Medical. Thanks for your excellent presentation. The ultrasound demo pictures and the gesture pictures inside are very enlightening. I love that. 
And we would like to cooperate with you on more webinars or other activities in the future. Oh, I think that'd be wonderful. I, I, I really enjoyed the, the experience. Thank you for having me tonight. Yes, we will keep in touch. Uh, Mark, thanks a lot for your efforts again. And uh, the questions you just asked uh, helped us to know more valuable knowledge. Thank you. You're welcome, Frank. Appreciate it. Thank and you. everyone in the broadcasting room, thanks for your watching today. I believe you must have got a lot of inspiration. And welcome to join our webinar on next Thursday again. At that time, Dr. George Chan Chen will present the sixth webinar with topic on ultrasound in MSK practice, foot and ankle. Let's stay tuned. See you.